as First Nations people in this province, we only make up roughly 3% of the overall population, but we make up over 13% of overdose deaths. I'll say that again. 3% of the overall population, over 13% of overdose deaths. Ace Whale, good day everyone. My name is Len Pierre. My ancestral name is Palikuluk. I am Coast Salish from Katsi First Nation on my father's side and Musqueam First Nation on my mother's side, which is one of the host territories on which we are gathered today. I am a father, a loving partner, a traditional knowledge keeper in my community. I am also an indigenous inst or an instructor in indigenous education. I teach indigenous history, indigenous culture, and contemporary issues within the healthcare setting and within the university setting. And through this work, I have found an incredible value in what I call a bridging of worlds, a bridging of realities. And to me, that is what decolonization is all about. To me, decolonization is about the deconstruction, dismantling, and disrupting cultural barriers that separate us, suppress us, and quite often oppress us. Decolonization is really about expanding our social perceptions. And if you will allow, tap into our indigenous worldview about matters so complicated and complex such as talking about drugs. And if you don't think that drugs is complicated, talking about drugs is complicated and complex, at your next family dinner, <laughs> there's a little bit of hesitation there because you don't want to spoil the, the mood at the dinner table. That's the essence of our talk and conversation today, is how are we going to continue this conversation in a good way? amidst an overdose crisis through an indigenous worldview. Because within our worldview, there's something to be gained and something to be learned. There's an ancient wisdom and a breadth of knowledge that can contribute to very important societal matters that we talk about across the globe. Matters of social justice and matters of environmental protection. Now I can go on and on and on and on about the, the value and, and benefits of decolonial work, but that's a whole of a TED talk. Today I would like to talk about decolonizing substance use and addiction. And I would like to take a moment to separate this, those two for you. I think quite often we hear about them and they are used interchangeably, but a big part of our work today is differentiating the two. And I'm going to use this as an example. How many of you have heard of the overdose crisis in the media, show of hands. Almost all of us. And where is the media really good at telling us that this crisis is contained? In large cities, back alleyways, and within the homeless population, right? We lose roughly four people a day in this overdose crisis. Now that may or may not seem like a large number to you, but those four people a day over the span of a year add up to over 1,500 British Columbian citizens. 1,500. A big part of our work today moving forward is carrying on a conversation. If we are not talking about this, we are not exchanging life-saving facts, factual information that can save lives and drastically uh, change the tide of this overdose crisis. So decolonization work is also really about destigmatizing substance use. Because at the end of the day, stigma is our real enemy here. Nobody wants to come out and say, have a conversation about drugs out of fear of the stigmas associated with it. Therein, we cannot have a safe conversation. Stigma is the really, real enemy here. And for us as Indigenous folks, we have a few lessons that we've learned about social stigma. What have we learned? We learned that stigma really requires four key things to survive. Lack of context, misinformation, I also call them myths, <laughs> 
discriminatory language, and bad policy. I was trying to come up with some really good scholarly and professional way of describing bad policy, but it's just bad policy. <laughs> so how do we go about moving forward in a good way? We want to destigmatize. And again, reflecting on what we've learned with an indigenous perspective, what is our lack of context? If we're overrepresented in overdose, substance use, and death, what is our missing context? We take colonialism as one of the root causes of addiction, and we highlight three colonial events, the residential schools, the 60s scoop, and land theft. Now, us as indigenous folks, we have survived, or endured many, many, many colonial events, but for this uh, activity, we'll only focus on these three. Each colonial event will leave behind certain residues, I call them. So for the residential schools, in case you are not familiar with them, was a Canadian assimilation policy implemented by the government of Canada and religious churches. And this assimilation policy, what it did is it removed every single Indigenous child from their communities and put them in boarding schools for 10 months out of the year. This occurred through the ages of 6 to 16, roughly. And during our children's stay in these schools, it was quite the norm, it was quite common for our children to experience sexual and physical torture, starvation, and in some cases, being beaten to death by the staff. This was in place for well over 100 years from coast to coast. Tell me that doesn't leave certain residues behind in the community after 100 years. I call them residues. What are the residues that we see left in community? A sense of fear, usually towards authority figures and institutions. A sense of shame, usually internally. And a sense of learned helplessness, which really instills a sense of hopelessness. And from the 60 Scoop, how many of us are familiar with the 60 Scoop? Not a lot of us. That's OK. That's why I'm here. In the 1960s, when the residential schools was slowly being phased out, the Canadian government, in all its colonial brilliance, implemented a new assimilation policy that would continue to remove Indigenous children from their families and their communities, and instead of putting them in boarding schools, put them in the foster care system. Often, never with valid reasons for the forced removal of children, our children were, and without intention of returning these children home. Our children were often sent south of the border and in some cases sent across the ocean to other continents. When I stand here, my elders remind me that Len, when you're doing this talk, it's important to remind us as a community that just because this is called the 60s scoop doesn't mean it ended in the 1960s. It still goes on today. We have more children in the foster care system today than have ever attended the residential schools at the peak of its operation. And what do we think uh, residues are left behind after this colonial event? A sense of isolation, loss of identity, and most definitely, a loss of rights. And from land theft, where we take our traditional territory of what we used to use to sustain us and we reduce it to less than 0.5%, what are the residues that are left behind? Poverty, lack of housing, and loss of freedom. Now, if we were to pool all those residues together and give them a theme, what would we call them? We call them a sense of trauma, grief, loss, and a sense of daily stress. Now, I look to you and I ask, can we meet and can we agree that trauma, grief, loss, and daily stress are drivers and reinforcers for addiction? Is there a relationship there? Yes. So this is our missing context. So if you have it within community-based conversations with your friend group or your family group that addiction is a choice, I invite you now to remove that from your vocabulary and your conversations that we do not choose to be addicted. We use addiction to feel good about something very bad that has happened. This is the missing context. These are difficult conversations to have, I know. Look at me, I'm sweating. Um, but this is really how we expand our social perceptions, by sitting in our own discomfort for as long as we can possibly bear it, listening, learning, and then validating that information. This is the missing context.
after missing context, substance use uh, stigma with a substance use needs a whole lot of misinformation to survive. I call it misinformation mountain because it's way too easy to pick up our phones, open up our social media app, and be exposed to all kinds of incorrect information. Um, I have one I'll share with you. I hear this all the time, and it goes like this. We just need to kick out all the people who sell drugs out of the community. That'll solve the problem. Sound familiar? That is a microcosm of Canada's war on drugs. Only if we take on a war on drugs, do you think that drugs can pick up a weapon and fight you back? No. This is a war on our own people. Only that war on our own people are the most marginalized and vulnerable sectors of our community. At the end of the day, what we know for sure is that prohibition is a failed policy, hence bad policy. And prohibition is, doesn't work. It's a failed experiment. And it's easy to think about this. If we think back to um, the United States in the early 1930s when alcohol was prohibited, during or before prohibition, what do we think the number one alcohol was that was consumed? Beer. During prohibition, what do you think the number one alcohol was that was consumed? Moonshine. Moonshine. Prohibition equals potency, and it doesn't work. So if you encounter that, that, that myth, that misinformation, I also invite you to drop that, put it aside. It's inaccurate information, and it doesn't work. The accurate information is that prohibition doesn't work. Lack of context, misinformation, discriminating language. If there is one thing, one thing you walk away with from this talk, please, please let it be re-examining and reusing and rethinking the way we use language when we talk about drugs, substance use, and addiction. Because what do we often hear? When we're talking about people who use substances, we often hear the term user, addict, or junkie. And I say that this is really important because language, the language we use, has this funny relationship in our brain that constructs our thoughts, and our thoughts construct our beliefs, and our beliefs are going to inform how we treat people who are using substances. So what I say is, use people first language. People who use drugs, people who drink, people who smoke. Because we don't want to be defined by our behaviors, we want to be defined as people first. And again, from our indigenous community, we've learned a thing or two. We've had all sorts of derogatory terms that have been applied to us over the years. Words I will not even utter on a public stage like a TED Talk. So please, please, if there's one thing that you take away, let it be reusing or rethinking the way we talk about substance use and people who are using drugs. Because it's dehumanizing language, really, at the end of the day. After discriminating language, it's bad policy. So I've already mentioned that prohibition um, is a failed experiment. Uh, prohibition is also rooted in racism. So to kind of frame this piece of the conversation, we, the overdose crisis is also referred to as the opioid crisis. Opioids are nothing new. Opioids have been used for a very, very long time. So when, where, and why did opioid, opioid use become illegal? Again, coming back to our local neighborhood here in downtown Vancouver, um, who built the Canadian Railway? Asian immigrants. And when the Canadian Railway was built, or finished and completed in the early 1900s, we had a massive unemployment problem. So what happened was that there were race riots in downtown Vancouver. And Musqueam First Nation has accounts of this, where Gastown burned down. Um, and so what happens? The Minister of Labor at the time, who would later become Prime Minister, comes all the way out from Ottawa to downtown Vancouver, sees that there's a race problem, goes all the way back to Ottawa and implements and births the policy for prohibiting opioid use for the Asian population. All prohibition policies are rooted in racism. Pick any drug and you uh, find out its source of origin, it's going to come from racist ideology. The thing about policy is that there's a little bit of good news. Because who creates Canadian policy? 
We do. You, me, we, us. We create those policies, and policies can be changed. Countries around the world today have already abolish their prohibition policies by decriminalizing people who use substances. Our own provincial health officer in British Columbia has made this call, put a call out for the decriminalization of people who use substances. We waste millions and millions and millions of dollars a year on the war on drugs. Imagine what healing could transpire if we invested that money into prevention, harm reduction, and treatment. I raise my hands to each and every one of you for picking up the fight of colonial harms that harm Canadian women, LGBTQ2 folks, people of color, people with disabilities, and people who use drugs. If there's one thing that you're looking for today, please let it be continuing on this conversation, but applying it with a decolonial lens and you can see what we've learned as an Indigenous community over the years is that we can transform the direction of our community by reconstructing the way we are talking about our traumas and spin them in a positive direction, a direction that is inclusive, compassionate to our fellow citizens, and engaging to the folks whom this topic matters most, to love and care for wholeheartedly. Thank you.